Our guest of the morning is Dan Leone of Space News. He's a staff writer. Good morning. Morning, Pedro. Uh, NASA, when it comes to its budget, where do we stand as far as approval from the House and the Senate? Well, right now, the House and the Senate are sort of midway through the 2015 appropriations process. The House has, the full House has passed their version of NASA's 2015 budget. You're looking at about 17.9 billion with a B. And the Senate's at about the same place. Uh, the Senate Appropriations Committee got their bill to the floor, and we might see some action on that next week. But they're uh, at about the same level with a few differences. When you take a look at the budget, not only did you produce a chart that breaks it down, we'll go through that, but here's the headline. Flat NASA budget shows where White House and Congress disagree. A couple of things. Let's start with a flat NASA budget. How does it compare with the years past? Well, if you go back a couple of years, then you find that NASA's about an $18 billion agency in round numbers this year. They took a whack and became about a $17 billion agency when there was a sequestration in 2013. And uh, if you go back in time and you make some adjustments for inflation, you see them floating at something like 18 to 20, and now they're on a downward slope. And uh, the flat budget has been, uh, flat's the new up, is a thing that the NASA people like to say a lot, like everyone else in the government. And what the White House and Congress disagree on is where to arrange the puzzle pieces under this flat budget. When you mean the puzzle pieces, what kind of pieces are we talking about? We're talking about the big stuff. We're talking about human space flight. We're talking about science, the robotic missions to other planets, the robotic missions to this planet, of which there are plenty. And uh, everybody has different ideas within Congress of which of those missions more urgently need the most money. And the White House has its own ideas, and uh, they'll have to reconcile this year like they do every year. But for the past couple of years, it's been the same arguments, more or less, under this flat budget, the same tug of war between the White House and Capitol Hill. Walk through some of the details then. On the science budget, about $5 billion I'm seeing. There are a mm -hmm. bunch of categories under it, but generally, the $5 billion, where, is it, where does it go to? There's two, there's two noticeably large, two of the five NASA science divisions are a little bit larger than the others, and that's Earth science, which is exactly what it sounds like, and there's planetary science, which is all the planets except for the Earth, and then you've also got sun science, you've got astrophysics, telescopes to look at the stars, and you've uh, also got inside the science account this massive telescope called the James Webb. This is the, the, uh, the spiritual successor to the Hubble Space mm -hmm. Telescope. And uh, on the Senate side, you've got some people who are more particularly interested in Earth science and astrophysics. On the House side, you have people who are more particularly interested in planetary science. So they will have to come eventually to an accord on which of their favorite programs get to have a nice piece of the pie this year. And uh, to that end, their interest in these programs probably depends on their interest in their congressional districts or their states? Well, like any other thing you could appropriate money for in Congress, yes, the short answer is yes. There, uh, Senator Barbara Mikulski, who is very powerful in the Appropriations Committee on the Senate side, she really loves the Goddard Space Flight Center, which happens to be in Greenbelt, Maryland. And they happen to do some work on the Earth science side and on the planetary science side. And by the way, they're building that James Webb Space Telescope. So some of uh, the question marks that are open as we're in the middle of an appropriations process, there's a good deal of foreshadowing just based on where the work is. Uh, exploration, about $4 billion, breaks down into three systems, exploration systems, commercial space flight, exploration R&D, uh, paint us a picture. In the exploration account, you have all of the human space flight stuff except for the International Space Station. So particularly within exploration, you're talking about the Space Launch System rocket. This is the great big rocket that NASA is building, which would lift a thing called the Orion crew capsule to places beyond the International Space Station, uh, perhaps to the vicinity of the moon and so forth. They're looking at a first flight in 2017 as a shakedown. But also within there, you've got what's called commercial crew and cargo services. These are uh, paying for commercially operated capability to do what the space shuttle used to do, ferry goods and services and eventually crew to and from the International Space Station, which remains at about $3 billion a year, the nation's premier human space flight program. To the headline that you showed, is there disagreement about the building of this uh, rocket amongst the members of Congress? 
Well, there, there's less disagreement uh, be, uh, about the big rocket between members of Congress than there are with members of Congress and other people within Washington, D.C. The big rocket actually has quite a good reputation on Capitol Hill, although uh, it, was, it was not admittedly the White House's priority when the Obama administration came in and began making decisions about what to fund within human space flight. So uh, currently, the SLS rocket's set up for a nice big budget increase if the Senate gets their way. and. Uh, and that's what it usually gets, frankly. So will this be the next step or the next space shuttle, so to speak? That's, that's a question that some of our, our uh, audience might have some very strong opinions about. But uh, insofar as it's, it's going to be a great big rocket that lots of people at NASA pay attention to and work on for their day jobs, yes. But it will do a little more than the shuttle did because the shuttle wasn't meant to go beyond the Earth. And the thrust of the SLS is that it will at last return us to faraway places, which is something the shuttle didn't do. Uh, the NASA budget, and it's, uh, we're going to take a look at details of it with our guest Dan Leone of Space News. If you have questions about not only the budget, but some of these programs you've heard about and some of the science that's involved, here's a chance to find out more, 202-585-3881 for Republicans. 202-585-3880 for Democrats and 202-585-3882 for Independents. If you want to send us a tweet, send us one at C-SPAN-WJ. If you want to send us an email, journal at C-SPAN.org. We had a chance to speak with a member of the International Space Station this week, uh, Steve Swanson, a commander there. He talked about this big rocket as you referred to it, gave his impressions of it. We'll let you listen to what he had to say and then get your add-on thoughts to it. Here's what he had to say. Well, right now the science is pretty much separated between the uh, U.S. side, or I should say U.S., uh, which includes uh, the Europe European Space Agency, uh, JAXA, Canada, uh, all those, and then the Russian side. So the science is somewhat separated. Uh, however, we do require the uh, Russians for us to get up here and to get back down right now. Hopefully in a few years we won't need that, but right now we need uh, that to do you happen and that is the, probably the biggest deal right there if, and if we can't get up here we can't do the science so Dan Leone he talked about not only you know trans essentially he's talking about going back and forth and also talked about dependence on the Russians can you expand on that well the shuttle stopped flying in 2011 in July so it was almost a couple of, uh, several years to the date now and that left us in a position where if we wanted to fly astronauts to the International Space Station, we had to turn to our senior partners on that project, the Russian Federal Space Agency, who does the job with its Soyuz rockets and space capsules, and they've done the job very well for very many years. And so at this point, NASA's thinking, well, it's time to bring this sort of business back over to, to U.S. soil. It's a, it's, a, it's a big point of pride for everybody to have American astronauts launching from American launch pads. And, and right now, NASA's in the final stages of a competition that, they hope, will allow that astronaut carriage from U.S. soil to resume. And uh, what the commander alluded to was that there's a couple of options on the table. There are three options on the table, in fact, so far as anybody knows about. And NASA's going to make a decision really soon about which one to pick. So three options from the three companies that are involved. That's right. Uh, ultimately, how do you pick one out of the three? Ultimately, it's going to come down to how comfortable NASA feels about the system that the company has proposed. Price is certainly going to be a factor. And as anybody at NASA will tell you, whoever has sold the agency on having the safest, most dependable approach is probably going to win this thing. And as far as when a decision is made, will then just money go to the company to build the rocket, or is this going to be a joint effort between NASA and the company that eventually wins? There's going to be a great deal of government investment in this. Uh, for example, the White House has had asked this year for almost $850 million to do that sort of work. And Congress has never been inclined to go all the way with the White House's request, but they're coming pretty close this year. The Senate has okayed $800 million as part of its appropriations package. and. That would go into this commercial crew program as NASA's generous share of the costs. Now, that's not to say that the companies won't have skin in the game. They absolutely will. But uh, they won't make any secret that their participation in the program is contingent on that aid from NASA, who needs this service to get the job done at the International Space Station. Several of the, several of the stories said that when the issue of full funding of this program came about, that's always been kind of a, a tug of war between Congress and the companies involved. You've got it. That's, that's been uh, the, when it comes to human space flight, that has been the point of disagreement between Congress and the White House. And they, they are and not so far apart in the cosmic sense, but they have 
clearly different opinions about how to go about replacing the, the space shuttle as a crew carrying system. Will we ever come back to the place where future space uh, space shuttles or not space rockets or the like ever become part of NASA solely again or will we always depend on commercial uh, entities? Well, what NASA will tell you is that they've been going to low Earth orbit for a long time. They have a great deal of experience with it. And the whole point of doing the commercial crew program is that NASA doesn't have uh, the time or the inclination and frankly the budget to be owning and operating the entire space transportation infrastructure by itself. They're going to try and encourage commercial operators to do this insofar as they can. Now, there's no great customer besides NASA for these commercial operators right this second, but I think NASA's hope is that if they can make the commercial crew and cargo program succeed, then they won't need to mess around in this close to home Earth orbit anymore, and then they can be in the business of owning and operating deep space vehicles. Dan Leone of Space News, he's a writer for that uh, publication, here to talk about space. Tell us a little bit about your uh, publication. Well, Space News has been around for decades, and they've been covering the business and politics of space. and. Like everybody else, for better or for worse or indifferent, we've got a print publication which you can carry around with you, folds up smaller than your cell phone, and we have a website. Uh, first call is from Pennsylvania. This is Randy for our guest, Dan Leone, on our Democrat slide. Randy, go ahead, you're on. Good morning. Why is NASA involved in geology? I mean, the ANS stands for Aeronautics in Space. What are they doing geology for? Thank you. Well, that's an interesting question. I've thought about NASA doing geology a lot, and uh, I I'm not exactly sure what the gentleman meant by NASA doing geology. Uh, it's certainly true they work with the U U.S. Geological Survey on a program called Landsat, and that's, th that's a long-running series of images that have been taken since the 70s, which are being taken right now. Um, in a really strict sense of tapping a rock with a chisel or something like this, uh, this is the basic work of planetary exploration that uh, any of our landed robotic missions are doing because, frankly, there is not a whole lot that you can get a robotic probe to do other than poke at rocks and take samples as Curiosity does on Mars now or take images from orbit as satellites around the Earth do. So uh, the short answer of why is NASA involved in geology? Because that's how you study another world. I'll take a stab at it, but he may have uh, thought, because it is a space administration, why there's a category for Earth science. <laughs> because the Earth is a planet. And uh, it happens that it's logistically a little bit easier to launch a mission to an Earth orbit than it is to launch a mission to a far planetary orbit. and. Uh, there are billions of human beings living on this planet and none living on the others. And so it's, this is not a new thing for NASA. In the 1958 legislation that created the agency, one of the mandates was to make this world a better place. And one of the ways in NASA and the White House's estimation that you can do that is by studying this planet from afar. Uh, Merritt Island, Florida, Independent Line. Gerald, good morning. Hello. Thank you for C-SPAN, by the way, wonderful service. Um, I want to ask Mr. Leone about the uh, poison pill that uh, Senator Shelby put into the Senate bill uh, requiring the commercial crew people to um, use federal acquisition rules accounting rather than the, uh, the they sign their contracts for fixed price. In other words, mm -hmm. the whole thing is the government gets a big savings from three to ten times. Well, if, if government did the work, it would be three to ten times more than the commercial people. But in, the, in that process, they lose the right to go to those companies and say, give me an accounting, a detailed accounting. The, the commercial crew people have the right to say, well, that's not in your business. Um, uh, you know, uh, we that's part of the deal. You just give us this fixed price that you said you were going to give you, and we'll give you the, the uh, equipment that you said you, you needed. Gerald, thank you. And you may have to set this up a little bit for the audience who hasn't been following that closely. Sure. So Gerald's question, he asked about a poison pill in the commercial crew competition. To back up a little bit, NASA has awarded contracts or NASA has given out funding for the commercial crew program 
using something, and this is into the weeds of, of bureaucratic speak here, called other transactional authority. For our purposes, what that means is NASA has two kinds of contracts, essentially, that they can use. One which is regulated by the federal acquisition regulations, which is the government's best shot to make sure it's getting a fair deal. There's a lot of oversight compliance with that, requires a lot of paperwork. In an engineering program, it can make things move somewhat slower, sw excuse me, slower. And then NASA has another option that it can use. And for the commercial crew work, it's used this other option before because it lets the engineering phases of the program move more quickly. It's not subject to the federal cost accounting standards that Gerald mentioned. And this brings us now up to the present. There's a commercial crew competition going on that NASA's going to use a regular old government contract for, and it sought exceptions, exemptions for some of the provisions of the federal accounting, excuse me, the federal acquisition regulations that include this poison pill Gerald asked about. So NASA wanted to make sure that the government was getting a square deal, but it also wanted to let these commercial contractors have free reign in their development process, make things move very quickly. And uh, Insofar as Senator Shelby introduced a poison pill, he, he said in a report that was part of the NASA budget that the, the Senate Appropriations Committee passed a little while back, he said, we want NASA's commercial crew program to use these standards. We want you to tell us where you're getting your supplies, how much they cost, and you have to prove to us that they cost that much. And by the way, the way that you prove that they cost that much is by having your supplier certified to participate in this program, too. There are some people who think that if this bill becomes law before NASA awards its next commercial crew contract, that NASA is going to have to go back and do the whole competition again because the fact that you have to comply with this provision means you might have gotten an entirely different result than you will if you just proceed with the competition the way it is now. Milford, Maine. Pam, up next. Democrats line. Hi. Hi. Um, I recently saw a public bro broadcasting system uh, video on um, it's called Earth from Space and it shows uh, what all these satellites that are circling the Earth uh, can see in terms of the movement of air and water of temperature and it really gives you a feeling that um, the Earth really is an organism and um, at the end of the program they mentioned that uh, some of these satellites are, are going out of service they're, they're old and they need to be replaced but that there's no money for replacing them. And I thought that NASA had some of those satellites up there uh, observing these wonderful things about our planet. Well, okay, uh, the, NASA has a great deal of satellites that are observing things about our planet. Um, it's true that there are some of them that have aged and are going out of service. This is a normal thing. Satellites are built for two years, three years, five years of service. It's called a primary mission. And essentially, that's the minimum that somebody who launches one of these hopes to get out of it once it's there. Lots of them, lots of them go much longer than their minimum missions and continue to return science about the planet for a very long time. But eventually, those will go out of service. Uh, NASA's Earth Science Division just talked about a couple, one in particular, Acromsat, which is an Earth observing satellite that's just gone on too long at this point. It's just gotten too old. Uh, the Earth Science Division and all the other science divisions are actively replacing their constellations, keeping them as healthy as they can afford to keep them. And so just because one satellite goes out of service or falls out of the sky or goes to a graveyard orbit doesn't mean that it won't be replaced. And especially in Earth sciences, I, I think that if you continue to pay attention to the program, you'll see new satellites going up. A viewer asked how much of NASA's science budget is concerned with climate change research projects. There's no easy answer for that because there, well, the bulk of it is going to be within the Earth Science Division, certainly, because if you're talking about climate change or global warming, then you're by definition talking about this planet. That's the 1.8 roughly billion dollar Earth Sciences Division's task. So they're the ones that are looking at things like carbon levels in the atmosphere. By the way, on July 1st, they're going to launch an orbiting carbon observatory. That's one more new satellite into the Earth observation train. And they're also looking at ocean temperatures, the state of glacier ice and polar ice, things like that. So uh, an easy answer for a cocktail conversation would be they've got a $1.8 billion Earth Sciences division that's doing 
science related to the earth, including climate change. Dominic, good morning from Springfield, Virginia, Independent Line. Yes, thank you for taking the call. My question is along the lines of, uh, I guess, what Mr. Leone has already alluded to, that NASA's got authorities to do things such as waive the federal acquisition regulation and uh, engage in more commercial-type procurements. We, we're seeing federal agencies uh, enter into what we commonly call public-private partnerships, alternative financing arrangements, because of the restricted federal monies that are available now because of the tight fiscal times we're facing. So the question to Mr. Leone is, do we expect NASA possibly to engage in public-private partnerships or similar arrangements where we might rely on private financing, but in exchange for example, uh, giving the private financing contractor property, equipment under, let's say, 30, 50, 100-year leases, or maybe more importantly, are there space interests or space rights that NASA might have being inherently governmental that it might exchange and give to the private marketplace those rights in exchange for the private financing? Thank you. Well, NASA, one of NASA's favorite words is private public partnership right now. That's what the agency believes it's doing with the commercial crew program and the commercial cargo program, which is ongoing. You mentioned long-term leases. There aren't a terrible lot of things that NASA actually controls in space. They own the things by international convention that they launch there. And they haven't, although they can and sometimes do make agreements to allow private entities to use those things that they have in space, it's not the same as a toll road. You're not going to lease something long term to a private company that put up the money to get the project done in the first place under your auspices. Now, if you're asking if NASA is going to go forward with more of these commercial-like procurements, I think the answer is undoubtedly yes. They have seen how it worked for them in delivering cargo to the space station, which is an ongoing project with two new rockets launching from Florida and Virginia, and they like it. They want some more of that. They have been very careful to say that they're not going to do this for every single program. If they're going to try and mount a mission to Mars, just for an example, then they're not necessarily going to look for the quickest and most commercial-like procurement with the you know, least amount of federal paperwork and minimal oversight and redundancy during the design process and things like that. Uh, but as far as can NASA essentially you know, fund an owner-operator the same way that the Dulles Greenway nearby here is? Uh, probably not as much. NASA will, even if it procures in a somewhat more commercial sense, probably remain in a landlord capacity for very, very big missions, particularly crude ones, I would think. Is Mars still on the table? Mars has never been taken off the table. In, in a rhetorical sense, but space missions don't just happen. Somebody has to pay for them, and there's not money in the budget right now that leads human explorers to Mars in a hurry, but this, as far as flying humans is concerned, is the agency's purpose. It's pretty much always said so, and it's never stopped saying so. Outside of the agency, active interest from the White House on these issues? The White House's priorities may not put boot prints on Mars absolutely first. Uh, the White House, for example, is very interested in climate change, and NASA is very capable of helping the White House push that frontier. So the White House has never said it is not interested in Mars. The White House has actually announced a proposed precursor Mars mission. Not everybody agrees this is a necessary precursor to Mars, but no one will tell you that it isn't a precursor to Mars. They've suggested tractoring an asteroid into a lunar orbit, sending people there to visit it. That hasn't been done. There are opportunities there to do what NASA calls retiring some of the risks related to going to Mars. It would be contributory, but it's, it's not a, a foyer directly to Mars, so to speak. How does the current work of NASA when it comes to space flight compare to other countries? Are we still, are, are we at the head or? I think by the numbers you have to say that absolutely yes. NASA's budget is, is far and away the largest space agency budget and there are tremendous space agencies doing tremendous things. Uh, it's, uh, there's China of course, which is 
launching a dozen space launches per year. That's sort of incredible. Uh, that's, you know, almost uh, NASA pace right there, almost on pace even when you add a lot of the commercial satellite launches in. China's still got an appreciable portion of the global launch count all by itself. Uh, Europe is doing very interesting missions to faraway places like a comet, their Rosetta mission. And uh, even so, NASA is still the 800-pound gorilla on this scene. Uh, Schamberg, Illinois. This is Jim. Thanks for waiting on our Republican okay. line. Go ahead. Good morning, yes. Uh, I just wanted to uh, correct an impression that Mr. Leone might have made with his comment about fair uh, standards and the poison pill. Uh, this really has nothing to do with uh, fiscal accountability or responsibility. Uh, the cost of there will be two outcomes of uh, forcing FAR on the commercial program. It will delay it and it will significantly increase its cost. Now if the commercial program had not been having money taken from it to fund SLS, which is sometimes derisively referred to as the Senate launch system, which was a pure pork barrel project, um, we would have the capability to be sending astronauts to the space station as early as next year instead of paying the Russian space agency $70 million per seat. Jim is well informed. This is the essential debate within human space flight of whether commercial crew should get all the funding NASA says or whether the space launch system should get all the funding that Congress says. And uh, the, the poison pill provision, if NASA indeed had to live with those provisions as part of its next commercial crew award, would, uh, and you know, the poison pill is only some people's words for it, it would in fact make the process slower. It would probably delay the day that the astronauts were actually to fly on these systems. And it frankly remains to be seen whether that provision's going to stay in the final version of the bill that comes out of Congress. Uh, you, the uh, viewer mentioned the Russians. Sure. A viewer off of Twitter says, how much of the current situation with Russia is affected at the International Space Station and its missions? Well, you know, I haven't been to Moscow lately, and I don't know what's happening behind closed doors at Star City where NASA officials are meeting with Russian counterparts, but uh, the fact of the matter is the station's operating right now. The, the U.S. cargo flights are still going up. If there are delays to cargo flights, it's not because the Russians say they don't want us there. It's because there are the usual problems with the rockets on the ground. Look, essentially, it's situation normal up there. Uh, this is a a big project that involves a lot of national prestige for both countries. You've had officials on the Russian side and on the U.S. side come out and say, hey, maybe you're all putting a little too much attention on the rhetoric here. So for the time being, things are normal on the International Space Station and our friends the Russians, other than telling us they don't want us to use one particular rocket engine for military launches anymore, essentially treating us the same as they always have. We had a chance to talk with Steve Swanson on board the station itself about the relations. Here's his perspective. Well, the next step is actually um, proving out the vehicle is safe for uh, humans, which are, we have a few companies now who are bidding for that uh, opportunity right now. And uh, once they start in their project, the end of that project, hopefully by 2017, we will have a manned test of an American vehicle at that time. And they'll probably do one test flight, uh, maybe just station, maybe not. Uh, but then the next ones from then on will start being uh, rotating crew members on the American vehicle. I don't know if that was the, the right stop, but he did talk about the fact that even though they have heated discussion or, you know, amicable discussions about relations, it doesn't affect the ultimate work of the science. He would know. He's living with Russians right now, which probably says a lot about the program. Uh, if you want to see that full interview, by the way, uh, it's available on our cspan.org website. Uh, Peter from Aberdeen Proving Ground, Maryland, is up next. Independent line, good morning. Uh, yes, good morning. Thank you. Um, there, I had a question going back a little bit in time. Uh, there was a book published in 1958 by a gentleman called... Uh, um, Robert Broussard, he was a Princeton uh, physicist, and the book is called uh, Nuclear Rocket Propulsion. 
Um, I read it, and then I understand uh, there was actually a nuclear rocket constructed um, in 1969 and passed ground tests. And the specific impulse of this rocket um, would improve performance over chemical rockets and, and uh, shorten space travel times by 75%. Um, I'm still curious as to what, in 1969, um, really much, <laughs> I was I was an infant, um, but and I'm getting up there in years now, but this seems to be an incredibly long time for a proven technology to for NASA to adopt. And if there's going to be a Mars mission, uh, let's just go for it, guys. I can't for the life of me understand what the holdup is. So nuclear propulsion is something that, that is always discussed when it comes to Mars missions and deep space missions particularly. Uh, just to give you the short version of this discussion, because I'm not a propulsion expert, I'm not a rocket engineer, it cost in the neighborhood of $60 million just to make sure that the teeny tiny bit of nuclear material aboard a Saturn orbiter called Cassini wasn't going to cause any ill effects to anyone's health in the unfortunate event that its launch vehicle, its rocket, was destroyed and scattered bits and pieces of the spacecraft all throughout U.S. airspace, right? Sixty million dollars just to make sure that this one tiny part of this mission, which by the way is still orbiting Saturn and, and is doing just fine, w was safe. So although there are professed advantages as far as your fuel efficiency, if you will, in making a long-term space jaunt with certain types of nuclear propulsion. The fact is that nobody's willing to expend the political capital and go through the expense of trying to get a, a nuclear-powered rocket straight off of a launch pad in, in Florida where lots of people's constituents live and eat and vote, you know, when you have perfectly good chemical-fueled alternatives. Rodney from Los Angeles, thanks for holding on. Republican line. Yeah, thank you for C-SPAN. I love you guys. I have uh, two real important questions for your guests, and I hope you answer it honestly. Is there any pushback for the climate change debate in NASA as it relates to the causes of it? I hear that there's a possibility that this planet, planet Nerubu or planet X, can also affect the uh, climate here on Earth. And also, as far as aliens, is there any proof that there are aliens, uh, uh, ex extraterrestrials that have visited uh, the planet in the past? Well, regarding Planet X, I've never seen it. And actually, I was reading on Twitter the other day that although there is some sort of new beyond Pluto body, the search for Planet X goes on uh, relative to Planet X's effects on the climate. Well. I don't know. I'm, I'm not a planetary geologist. I'm not a soil scientist or anything like that. And, uh, well, it's funny you mention extraterrestrial intelligence, though, as I, I remember once, not too long ago, I was talking to a gentleman, a scientist, an astronomer at NASA. And just before I, I left the, the center that day, I turned around and I said, look, for the record, nobody here has discovered aliens and not told me, right? And, uh, the, and the gentleman folded his arms and looked at me and said, I'm not saying. Officially, though, there's no record of extraterrestrial intelligence, although NASA's astrophysics division will tell you any time that you ask them. They've got telescopes out there looking for signs. Uh, as far as the wide, sp where NASA spread out, is it Florida, Texas, Maryland, and Alabama are the main uh, bases, or are there other places as well? You left out a very notable one in California. That's the Jet Propulsion Laboratory, so uh, if you can remember all of those pictures and videos of people crowding into Times Square to watch, quote unquote, seven minutes of terror as the Curiosity rover descended to the surface of mm -hmm. Mars, the Jet Propulsion Laboratory is essentially responsible for the United States' ability to do things like setting a large payload down. But yeah, you hit on some of the big ones. There's also the Ames Research Laboratory in California. There's definitely uh, Marshall in Huntsville. Uh, they're taking care of the SLS project. There's uh, the Johnson Space Center in Houston. Houston, we have a problem. There's Maryland, there's Florida, and there's there's even a, a presence in Mississippi too. You've got the Stennis Space Center. It's all 
tied into the rocket work Marshall does. You hit on the big ones, and I, I think I filled in the gaps there for you. Did that, as far as the need for these many spread out bases, did that change because we don't have a shuttle program anymore? No, NASA's always had a national presence because that offered, you know, politically people a way to see that the space program, which back in the Apollo era we were committing to very hard for, for reasons of national imperative, you know, you needed to show everybody there's something in this for you. We can all do this and come together. So that's, that's an artifact of the way that NASA was, and it's for the foreseeable future because it's probably politically impossible for one agency to just decide it's going to change how many field centers it has. That's the way it's likely to remain. Here's Fred from New Hampshire, Democrats line. Hi. Good morning. Uh, I have a two-part question. First of all, um, in this world of deficit spending that we seem to be in, what do I personally get from the space station? And uh, until we're flush and have a balanced budget, would it be possible to do things to cut back, like subleasing our space on the space station as an effort to balance the budget for a short period of time, at least to make the effort? I'll take my answer on the air. Thank you very much. Sure thing. All right. Fair question. What do you personally get out of the space station? Well, I'm not sure. That part's sort of up to you. What does anybody in general get out of the space station project? Uh, you know, it's, it's not like it's a, a science fiction enterprise where they can, you know, grow lots of food in some kind of futuristic orbiting greenhouse or something like this. The, uh, the main purposes of the space station, although they do do a great deal of science there, there is basic research science going on up there, just as there is basic research science going on down here. The difference is we have gravity here, and they have no gravity up there. Some people who do the sort of science you have to go to school for a long time to be allowed to do well feel that it is worth doing that science up there. Um, the other big thing that they get out of the space station is the ability to what NASA calls live and work in space. Uh, if you want to learn about space, there's nothing quite like being there, just like if you want to learn how to sail, and well, there's nothing quite like going out onto the ocean. So that's a big part of what NASA is doing with the International Space Station. They are accepting the worthiness of being in space and learning how to live, work, play, and build in space at face value. Uh, Jerry from Alabama, we are just about done, so if you can launch right in with your question or comment, please. Okay. Uh, I was wanting to ask uh, about, could he say something about Elon Musk's companies? He uh, is the uh, main inventor or manufacturer of the Tesla, and uh, it's a fantastic car. And, and his, he has got a, a, a contract with NASA to... Uh, uh, are, are I, think we, I think we get where you're going with this call. Sure. Yeah. You want to talk about Elon Musk? Elon Musk is the founder of several companies, including Space Exploration Technologies, popularly known as SpaceX. They are doing something which hasn't been done much in this country. They are a vertically integrated rocket and spacecraft manufacturer. When NASA wants to build a rocket and spacecraft, they are pretty much horizontally integrated. They pull in their supplies from across the country and assemble it and put it on the launch pad in one particular place. SpaceX does a lot of that stuff in-house and Elon Musk, he was here in town just this week showing off his latest spacecraft which he hopes will be sending astronauts to the International Space Station. He's competing with two other companies for that business and he personally feels that we need to get millions of tons of cargo and hundreds of thousands of people on Mars and if you ask him he will tell you that's why he started SpaceX. Dan Leone with Space News, and you can find more of the information about the publication at spacenews.com. How often are you posting uh, stories to? We are posting stories daily. Spacenews.com is the uh, publication. Thanks for your time. Thank you, Pedro. Uh, coming up uh, today, uh, you may want to stay tuned at 11 o'clock today. It's the Iowa State uh, GOP convention. That's going to be at 11 o'clock today, live on C-SPAN. It will include speakers including Louisiana Governor Bobby Jindal, Kentucky Senator Rand Paul, and the 2012 presidential candidate Rick Santorum. The coverage of that will begin at 11 o'clock today. As far as tomorrow's program, an interesting big week in politics this week, we'll discuss that and what's ahead on tomorrow's program with Derek Wallbank of Bloomberg News. Domenico Montanero of the PBS NewsHour will join us also for that discussion. Plus, Kimberly Kagan, former advisor to U.S. forces in Iraq from 2008 to 2009 
and the founder and president of the Institute for the Study of War on the current violent in Iraq, uh, violence in Iraq. That will be at 845. We'll look at the papers and take your calls as well as Washington Journal comes your way at 7 o'clock tomorrow. We'll see you then.